Damn, I knew it. I knew it. Season ain't even started yet, and we already talking about LeBron and Bronny, okay? That's one subject matter. Another is NFL weekend, okay? A whole bunch, a whole slew of stories to get into. There's a presidential nominee that's about to go on the campaign trail. Finally, as far as I'm concerned, and P. Diddy's mama got something to say that she wanted everybody to hear. I'm listening. I'm listening. Stephen A. Smith show in the house. Let's roll. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you at the very least three times a week over the digital airways of YouTube and, of course, iHeartRadio. As always, I like to pause and take a moment to show my love and appreciation to all of my followers, all of my subscribers, all of my listeners. We continue to climb each and every single day. We have now eclipsed over 875 thousand subscribers for the show right here on YouTube and of course on iHeartRadio. We've exceeded over 3 million downloads. Cannot thank y'all enough for the love and support that y'all have accorded us. Keep the love coming and I'm going to keep on coming. To continue to like and follow the Stephen A. Smith Show, just click the bell and get notified for all of our new content and you too shall be the latest member of the Stephen A. Smith Show family. While you're doing that, please don't forget to pick up a copy of my New York Times bestselling book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes now in paperback just go to straightshooterbook.com to get yourself a copy once again that's straightshooterbook.com to get yourself a copy let's get started with the story lines after the weekend we're going to get started with the nba specifically preseason basketball that tipped off this weekend Several teams were in action, including LeBron James and the Los Angeles Lakers, who took on the Phoenix Suns. But yesterday was particularly special because we were all witnesses to history. It happened at the start of the second quarter when Bronny, LeBron's son, checked into the game and joined his father on the basketball court. This marked the first time in history that a father and son played together in an NBA game. Here's what LeBron had to say after the game. The moment Bronny's on the court with you, how did it feel as a father and, and as a player? Uh, not real. Um, still kind of get a little bit used to it, but uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool um, for the both of us and especially for our family. For a father, I mean, it means everything. I mean, I mean for you know, someone who didn't have that, you know, growing up, uh, to be able to be able to have that influence on your kids and have the influence on your son, to be able to have moments with your son. Um, and then ultimately, you know, to be able to work with your son, I think that's one of the greatest things that a father could ever hope for or wish for. So it's pretty cool. We kind of stood next to each other. I kind of looked at him and it was just like, like the Matrix or something. It just, did, it just didn't feel real. So, um, but it was great to have those moments out there with him. Now, here's the deal. I've noticed, I'm sure y'all have noticed that many people have been critical of the fact that Bronny is on the team to begin with. But guess what? I'm not one of them. I want to say this because it's important to point this out, okay? I will be critical of LeBron James when it's called upon. He is not the GOAT in my estimation. It will always be Michael Jordan when compared to him. I have LeBron at number two. That's number one. The other part about all of this is that, you know what? You want to shoot jump shots instead of going to the hole? You're, you're reticent or hesitant to get to the free throw line in critical moments. I'm going to get on him about that, too, which I have in the past. No need to do that now because he ain't scared to do that anymore the way he was earlier in his career. But it doesn't negate the fact that this is one of the greatest players to have ever played the game of basketball. He is on the Mount Rushmore of basketball. And on top of it all, what he has done for the game is immeasurable. And my appreciation for LeBron James and our appreciation collectively as basketball fans should always be, as he would state, surreal, to say the least. It is a damn travesty that you got people running their damn mouths, acting like it's a problem that he got his son on the team. We're now learning, based off of numerous reports that have come out the last few days, that the Golden State Warriors were contemplating grabbing Ronnie James at the 52nd overall pick but passed on doing so in order to respect the wishes of LeBron James because they knew that the Lakers had the 55th pick and that Bron LeBron James was going to make sure that the Lakers grabbed him. Ladies and gentlemen, LeBron has earned this. 
Bronny has something to prove. Bronny has something to earn. He's got to put forth the work and the effort over a lengthy period of time to show that he's worthy of being in the NBA. All of that is true. But in terms of the skids being greased, pardon the phrase, so Bronny James could be on the Lakers as opposed to another NBA team, why is that a problem? Coaches do that. Executives do it. There's a whole host of folks in the, throughout the world of sports that facilitate things, that engage in a level of nepotism that we all notice because it's flagrantly obvious. Are you kidding me? This is Bronny James, the son of LeBron James. And when we think about the NBA and what it has become, and the $76 billion 11-year deal they recently signed with various television networks and streaming operations. I got news for you. Is that possible if it were not for LeBron James? You have any idea what LeBron James has done for the game of basketball? What LeBron James has done for the world of sports? And for him to have his son on the team with him, I got no issues with it whatsoever. I have zero issue with it whatsoever. LeBron James has earned that. Bronny James has something to prove. Fair enough. But LeBron James has earned it. He has earned our respect, our reverence, our deference, our appreciation for us to look at something that he wants and say, excuse me, can we do that for him? Yes, we can. Not just the Lakers, but NBA fans everywhere. Yes, we owe it to LeBron James to be receptive and courteous enough to appreciate the fact that he wanted to wear the same uniform playing on the same basketball court as his son and that he did what he could to make that happen. If he were not so great, if he were not so phenomenal, if he was not such a winner, he would not have been able to pull this off. But why was he able to pull this off? Because damn it, he's LeBron James and the rest of us are not. And if somewhere down the line, Steph Curry ends up having a kid that can get to the NBA level, and that's what Steph Curry wants, guess what? It's worth consideration doing that for him too. Why not? When you've meant that much to the league, when you've done that much for the league, when we've spent decades profiting off your greatness, and there's evidence to show what LeBron James has meant, Remember when he departed from Cleveland? It cost a billion dollars to the local economy when he was gone. That's why they burnt this jersey in effigy. That's why they were so disgusted. That's why he was the pariah that he was, because he meant that damn much. Well, guess what? He still does, more than a decade later. And it's because of that that you should have no problem with him facilitating his son having an opportunity to play in the same uniform on the same team for the same franchise as his daddy. And last point, these are the Lakers. It's the most storied franchise in basketball annals, arguably outside of the Boston Celtics. And with that being said, they still needed LeBron James to keep them relevant over the last few years. Delivered a title in the bubble, got to a Western Conference Finals a couple of years ago, been in the playoffs the last couple of years. He's done a lot. He deserves this. Bronny is Bronny, but it ain't about Bronny. It's about Bron, as in LeBron. He deserves this. Stand back, fall back, chill the hell out, and let the man do his thing with his son. And let's see what, how Bronny develops in the years to come. Not this year, in the years to come. Don't use year one to judge him just because you want to hate on LeBron James. Let's move on, because I got a lot to say about week five of the NFL uh, situation right now. But first, a word from my friends at Prize Picks. Let me just take a second to make sure that everybody out there knows I'm in it to win it. 
And I demand nothing short of excellence, no question about that. And that's why right here at the Stephen A. Smith Show, we've decided to team up with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app with over 3 million members to help turn all my sports knowledge into some big time cash. You see, Prize Picks is a daily fantasy app where you just choose two, three, or even up to six players from your favorite sports teams and then pick more or less on their projected stats for the game. You like Josh Allen? Pick him. You like Bryce Harper? Pick him too. You like Travis Hunter? Then damn it, pick all three. It takes less than 60 seconds to make your picks, and then you sit back and watch the winnings roll right in. And get this, sign up with code SAS, and prize picks will give you $50 instantly when you play your first $5 lineup. You don't need to win your lineup to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. All you have to do is play a $5 lineup on prize picks, and you'll get $50 instantly. Prize picks, pick more, pick less. It's really that easy. Back here at Stephen A. Smith Show. Now let's get to some quick hitters that stood out from week five yesterday. First order of business I'll start with is the Baltimore Ravens who beat the Cincinnati Bengals in overtime, 41-38. Two things became very apparent yesterday. Number one, Lamar Jackson is making some noise. I know a lot of people out there think he's in route for his third MVP trophy. I'll touch on that in a minute. The second thing is that's apparent, as actually, is how silly the Dallas Cowboys look for passing up on Derrick Henry. Let's get to that first order of business first. For those of you who think that Lamar Jackson is en route to his third league MVP, pump the brakes. Pump the brakes. I say that not because of some absence of greatness on his part, because he was absolutely phenomenal yesterday. 348 yards passing, 26 of 42, four touchdown passes, okay? 55 yards rushing. I get it, even though Joe Burrow did his thing as well. Here's the thing that you have to remember. When we look at the success of the Baltimore Ravens, obviously their defense is leaving a lot to be desired for the most part this season thus far. Their offense has been prolific, particularly over the last three weeks. We look at Lamar Jackson and we say, damn, he's a big reason as to why that is. Here's the other big reason. How about Derrick Henry? Have you seen him rushing with the football? He ran for 151 yards against Dallas. Ran it for 199 yards a week later. Had a 51-yard scamper in overtime to set up the game-winning field goal for them yesterday. The brother is spectacular. He's a big boy. He's a man amongst boys at the running back spot, and we know what he brings to the table. That's going to be the reason why it's going to be hard for you to give Lamar Jackson the MVP. If Lamar Jackson was fling flinging that football to a wide receiver a la Tyreek Hill or somebody, and he was catching for 1,800 to 2,000 yards receiving, well, somebody threw him the football so you could give the MVP to Lamar Jackson. But when you handing the ball off to Derrick Henry and this brother is running roughshod over the competition, and guess what? All of a sudden, that changes things because you're handing him the football. So that's going to dilute some of the prowess and the impact that you have towards capturing league MVP honors yet again. That's my position. But as it pertains to Derrick Henry and the Dallas Cowboys, how silly do you look right now if you're the Dallas Cowboys for passing up on Derrick Henry? Let's think about that for a second here. We're talking about a situation involving Derrick Henry where you're the Dallas Cowboys and you have no running game. Over the last two weeks, even though you stopped the run, it was against the Giants and the Steelers. That don't count. Not much anyway. I would feel a lot better about the Steelers if they had that Cat Warren in the backfield with Najee Harris as opposed to just Najee Harris because it ain't the same. But when you look at the Dallas Cowboys, without Michael Parsons, without Demarcus Lawrence, they still beat the Pittsburgh Steelers, major props to them, but they didn't look good. Dak Prescott was en route to one of his worst games ever before he came to the rescue with that four-yard touchdown catch, Jalen Talbert. In the end, what it comes down to is this. The Dallas Cowboys could have used a formidable running game. That would have relieved Dak Prescott of a lot of responsibilities, which would have been better for him. They didn't do that, which is why we don't assume they're going anywhere. That's one reason. Here's the other. It's going on in Washington, D.C., where the commanders are 4-1 and, and on top of the NFC East. The commanders beat down the Cleveland Browns yesterday, led by rookie quarterback Jaden Daniels, who threw for 238 yards and one touchdown, also rushed for another 82 yards and 11 carries. That's a legitimate MVP candidate right there, Jaden Daniels. If you don't know, now you know. They're 4-1. They got a lot to prove. But when you consider the fact that the brother's completing 77% of his passes, he's already thrown for over 1,100 yards. He's thrown for just two interceptions on the season. He's one of the prolific rushers out, of the, out, of, out from behind center at the quarterback position in the National Football League. And they're winning football games. 
these Washington commanders don't look like the same Washington commanders. Just think about it for a second. There's no longer Daniel Snyder. They got new ownership with Josh Harris and Magic Johnson and their group. Okay, you got a new head coach in Quinn. All right, you got a new offensive coordinator in Cliff Kingsbury. You got a star new quarterback in Jaden Daniels who's reminding you of RG3, except he appears to know how to slide and not take on vicious hits like he was doing at LSU. So all of those things spell good times in the nation's capital. We're not accustomed to saying that about the nation's capital, but we got to change our thinking when we're watching this brother produce. I can tell you that much. Now let me move on to Pittsburgh, where the Steelers lost to the Cowboys last night, 20-17, to like I told you earlier, on Dak Prescott's game-winning touchdown throw in the final seconds. Quarterback Justin Fields didn't play particularly well, throwing for just 131 yards, had a total QB rating of just 35.5. Having said all of that, though, I still believe there's no problem with him remaining the starting quarterback for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Here's why. Because he's not their problem. Where's your running game? It's virtually non-existent. As a receiving group, you have a grand total of one touchdown, which is tied for worst in the National Football League. You clearly need another receiver to go alongside George Pickens. Fryermuth and Pickens ain't enough for you. Van Jefferson ain't going to be enough for you, along with whoever else you, the hell else you have at the White House spot. The Pittsburgh Steelers need to go out and either get Deontay Johnson back, get a guy like Devontae Adams, or somebody else. They need help. They need help at the wide receiver spot. You need somebody that's going to get open. And this Cat Pickens, who I like because he's a stud, you can't have some eye black under your eyes saying always effing open. You can't do that. And then you don't catch the ball. You had two receptions for about four yards last night until that 22-yard reception you caught in the fourth quarter. That's it. That ain't enough. You need more. Steelers need some help. They need some help with an additional wide out, and they need Warren back from his sprained right knee. When that happens, if your quarterback still looks the same, then come talk to me. Outside of that, whether you keep Justin Fields in the lineup or you replace him with Russell Wilson, I don't expect much from the quarterback position if receivers can't get open. It's really that simple. For the last NFL quick hitter, we'll go to Houston, where the Bills lost to the Houston Texans 23-20. The Bills had the ball deep in their end zone with less than a minute on the clock and threw three consecutive passes, failing to kill time off the clock. The Texans got the ball back and eventually kicked the game, winning 59-yard field goal to win it. Sean McDermott looks horrible here. Simple. You're the coach of the Buffalo Bills. The clock is on your side. You've got the ball at your own five-yard line. You know you need time clicking off the clock and you throw the football all three times? There's no Stephon Diggs there anymore. There's no Gabe Davis there anymore. You got Coleman and others, but you don't have all your weapons. And you still put it in Josh Allen's hands to throw the football on three consecutive possessions? That is as bad as it gets. The only credit Sean McDermott deserves is for acknowledging it and manning up to his mistakes. I don't know what he's thinking, of, but I know Bill's Mafia and the rest of the fans in Buffalo have grown tired of this man. They are not happy with what they're seeing from him. They are not happy. So somehow, some way, he's not the kind of coach that's going to get fired during the season. But if things keep on this course, don't be surprised if there's a change in Buffalo. You can't waste away the great years of Josh Allen. Can't do it. Can't do it. Coming up, Sean Diddy Cone's mother speaks up on his behalf. But will it help the music mogul currently sitting in jail awaiting his federal sex trafficking and racketeering trial? I'll get into that. But first, Vice President Kamala Harris is getting ready to do a media blitz with just four weeks to go before the presidential election. I'll talk about that and then some. Stick around. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show in the house coming your way over the digital airways of YouTube and, of course, iHeartRadio. Back with more in a minute. What does the future hold for business? Ask nine experts and you'll get 10 answers. It's a bull market. It's a bear market. Rates will rise or fall. Inflation's up or down. Can someone invent a crystal ball, please? 
Until then, over 38,000 businesses have future-proofed their business with NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud ERP bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, and HR into one fluid platform. With one unified business management suite, there's one source of truth giving you the visibility and control you need to make quick decisions. With real-time insights and forecasting, you're peering into the future with actionable data. When you're closing the books in days, not weeks, you're spending less time looking backwards and more time on what's next. Whether your company is earning millions or even hundreds of millions, NetSuite helps you respond to immediate challenges and sees your biggest opportunities. Download the CFO's Guide to AI and Machine Learning for free at NetSuite.com slash SAS. That's NetSuite.com slash SAS. I'll say it one more time. NetSuite.com slash SAS. Welcome back to Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the Digital Airwaves of YouTube. Let's turn to politics for a quick second here. Before I get into P. Diddy, I'll get into that in a second. But I want to do this politics thing right here because Vice President Kamala Harris, the Democratic presidential nominee, has begun a media blitz with just four weeks to go before the election. Harris and our running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walls, are set to appear in a handful of interviews with traditional and new media figures this month. The two sat down with 60 Minutes for a pair of interviews that will air this week. Harris is also scheduled to sit down with The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, The Howard Stern Show, and The View. The media blitz from Harris and Walls comes after weeks of criticism from Republicans who've accused the pair of avoiding taking questions from the media. I can't be happier. Personally speaking, I would like to see them both go into enemy territory because, my, in my opinion, it's real easy to go and sit down with people who are clearly in opposition of the other candidate. So when you are neutral or you are somebody that is the opposite or an, or an adversarial, or adversarial person for the competition, in favor of the competition, I don't have a problem with that. Because to me, that's where real questions get asked. And nobody can accuse something of being softball. I'm not saying they're all softball questions, but people can make those accusations. And that's not healthy for a cynical society that's looking for an excuse to point the finger at you, that you ain't stepping up, that you ain't embracing competition, that you're not accepting it, you're not doing those things. I don't like that. I don't like that. Now I'm going to sit up there and tell you right now, I've made it a point to highlight the fact that I'm going to vote for Kamala Harris. But I don't sit up there and say to you, I'm not going to vote for Trump because of politics, because I believe the world is cyclical. Sometimes you need different things. Sometimes you need different policies compared to what you may need at other times. And the prism of history usually tells us who's more effective as a commander in chief than somebody else. But when I think about Trump, I think about the fact that the presidency is supposed to be about statesmanship. It's supposed to be about galvanizing Americans and bringing us all together for a common cause and making sure we understand that you don't just say America first. We epitomize America first because we take care of one another. And when I see any politician only doing that for their constituency, their supporters, and saying the hell with everybody else, I get very, very concerned. Now, in the case of Kamala Harris, to be fair, what am I saying about her? You got to go out there and do those interviews. Biden wasn't doing interviews. There was no primary. After there was no primary and he shows up June 27th and wet the bed during the debate against Donald Trump, which ultimately facilitated him stepping out of the race and propelling you to being the Democratic nominee for the presidency of the United States. You didn't have to go through a primary either. And the last time we saw you in a primary, you couldn't even make it to Iowa. So again, can you stand the heat? I believe Kamala Harris can. I just want to see her show the world she can. Now, she did it in the debate. I don't care what anybody said. She smoked Trump during that debate. He babbled on where they're eating pets, they're eating dogs, they're eating cats. Remember that? And he looked ultimately silly. And Kamala Harris had a field day with them. But then J.D. Vance showed up in the vice presidential debate against Tim, against Tim Walls, and everybody wants to say he was lying, he was lying, he was lying about this, he was lying about that. Or Tim Walls seemed nervous, nervous, nervous. Here's the reality. Tim Walls' job was to make J.D. Vance look as radical as he had appeared to be in the past on top of the fact that you had to make him look like not so much of a nice guy. And you didn't do that. 
As a result, that's why this media blitz is necessary. And you, Kamala Harris, you got to show up and you got to answer questions. Whether or not you flip-flop, what are your positions? Why are those positions such as they are, et cetera, et cetera? What about the economy? What about inflation? How are you going to sit up there and tell us that people making under $400,000 ain't going to get taxed extra? But we got trillion, you got trillions of dollars in debt. Why are we going to pay it back? These are questions that deserve to be asked and deserve an answer. A truthful answer that allows us to say we agree or we disagree. Now, I know that's saying, hey, what about him? Because he never tells the truth, as in Donald Trump. That may be the case. But you have people on the right who have said, hey, he has a record because he has already sat in that seat. And we have four years of him governing. The world was divisive. He didn't make it any better. It seemed to be chaos. All of those things are true. But in the end, they were able to point to an economy that existed before COVID came along and say, he did all right. So which side are you taking? We don't know. You know how we find out? Through interviews. Interviews that are conducted by folks who are very objective and neutral and piercing and probing in their deliveries, in their presentations, to make sure they send a message that this ain't about whether I like you or not. This is about how much the American people should like you or not. You see who Trump has talked to? You see who Kamala Harris is planning on talking to, if she hasn't already. At some point in time, a neutral party who doesn't give a shit about either side is what we're after when it comes to asking these questions. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Now let's move on to P. Diddy himself. We got to get to the latest on Sean Diddy Combs. The music mogul is currently in federal custody awaiting trial on sex trafficking, racketeering, and conspiracy charges. He's pleaded not guilty. Not guilty. Meanwhile, his mama, Janice Combs, she took to social media yesterday in response to federal allegations levied against her son. Here's just a portion of the statement she released yesterday through her attorney, quote, it is heartbreaking to see my son judged, not for the truth, but for a narrative created out of lies. To be a witness to what seems to be like a public lynching of my son before he has had the opportunity to prove his innocence is a pain too unbearable to put into words. Not being entirely straightforward about one issue does not mean my son is guilty of the repulsive allegations and the grave charges leveled against him. My son is not the monster they have painted him to be, and he deserves the chance to tell his side. I can only pray that I am alive to see him speak his truth and be vindicated." End quote. First off, to Mrs. Combs, nobody should dismiss the power of your words and the unconditional love you have for your son. You gave birth to this man. Everybody, any man knows that has had a wonderful mama in his life knows about the power that unconditional love from mama brings to any of us. That's a given. I miss my mama every day. God rest her wonderful soul. I wouldn't be the man that I am today if it were not for her. But in fairness, please understand that these are very serious allegations against your son and they ain't being it's not being conveyed and disseminated in the court of public opinion for nothing. It's there because the federal government, Homeland Security, raided the homes in Miami and Los Angeles of your son and ultimately arrested him and indicted him on sex trafficking and racketeering charges. We get where you're coming from and we understand it, but do you know respectfully, ma'am, how much this falls on deaf ears. And I say that respectfully because you're his mom. There is no one 
who believes for one second that you would believe there's a shred of guilt that should be attached to your son with these specific allegations that have been leveled against him. Nobody's going to believe that. That's like a mama coming on the stand as a character witness. Well, what else do you expect her to say? Why would she say anything different? It's rare, it's an extreme aberration for one's parents to speak publicly against their child when such heinous allegations have been leveled against them. That is the fact. And the fact that your statement was issued through a lawyer doesn't help because it gives the impression that the lawyer, in concert with Sean Diddy Combs, decided to go through you to convey and disseminate a message that, dare I say, would be deemed believable more so in their eyes coming from you than from a lawyer. Not recognizing the level of cynicism that exists in this world today. And that the statement coming from you is not going to move anybody. Anybody. That's point number one. Number two, who's painting P. Diddy Cones to be a monster? The public hasn't. We all want to wait and see. I personally am praying he's innocent of these charges that he's innocent of the allegations that have been leveled against him. But anybody who's attached any level of guilt have usually been the people he has been associated with, he has done business with. An individual in Cassie Ventura, the ex-girlfriend who we saw on video being assaulted by him, or those in his inner circle, including family members, who have been conspicuously quiet. I'm not even bringing up the people in the industry who won't even say anything about him. They give love and prayers to his family and his loved ones. Not a single soul outside of mom has come forward to say he's innocent, innocent, innocent. The closest person to that was Kevin Lyles, who resigned as the CEO, I'm sorry, as an executive with Warner Music. He was an outspoken supporter of Diddy, and on the day Diddy was arrested, he resigned. So this is not about people painting Diddy to be a monster. This is about the federal government saying he is being specific with what they're charging him with, sex trafficking and racketeering, and people echoing the charges that have been levied against him to such a degree that he went to New York two weeks in advance, anticipating being arrested, that he would turn himself in. Then they wouldn't even give him an opportunity to turn himself in because they met him at a hotel in New York City where they cuffed him and gave him that perp walk outside. And then thereafter, they denied him bail, not just once, but twice. Every word I just uttered is fact. It's not painting a picture in a narrative and trying to create some kind of imagery or vision of Diddy. That's, that, that's Diddy right there. That's him. That's not a painted image of him. That's really him. When he was arrested, that was really him. When the feds came and get him, that was really the feds. When he was placed in a jail cell in Brooklyn. It's not a movie. It's not a video. It's really him. And now the world is transfixed on the music industry in Hollywood, if for no other reason, to see whether he will fall, will there be others, and if there are others, is it because he is going to take others down with him unless he's completely exonerated. That's the story. And one of the things we have to get out of right now, right here and now, is the lynching part. We ain't gonna go there. Racism exists everywhere. 
that is true. It doesn't matter how rich you are, or how broke you are. You're going to experience it in this world in some capacity. That is undeniable. But this man is worth over half a billion dollars. He's run Bad Boy Entertainment. He starred in TV shows and movies and on commercials. He's been a leader in a prolific industry known as the music industry, hip hop. For all the maladies, for all the negativity that comes associated with racism, when did that apply to him? By the way, when we talk about things like that, we know he's one of the biggest Democratic donors, right? One of the biggest proponents of getting out the vote, right? Once given the key to the city less than two years ago, New York City, the key to the city, right? Politicians clamoring for his support throughout the years, right? How are we going to bring up lynching after all that? I'm just looking in my studio. Am I right in bringing that up? How are we going to do that? We, we respectfully, Mrs. Combs, we can't do that here. Not here. I hope he's innocent of what he's accused of. I met Diddy at basketball games. I saw him. I even took a picture of him with him once at the Golden State Warriors game. Years ago, I had a picture of me and him hanging up in my house. I was happy to meet Diddy. I knew how great he was and what he's done for the music industry and what he's done for so many hip-hop artists. Can't do that right now. He's got to prove his innocence. And until he does that, none of what you said applies, Mama Combs. Do you know why? Because your mama... No one's going to believe your objective. No one's going to believe your fact base. Cassie Ventura was assaulted on video. Even you acknowledged in your statement, he isn't perfect. Well, what the government is saying is how many imperfections do you need to see? Because we got something to show you. What are those imperfections? You're talking as if you know. Well, there are many people that do things wrong. And the last people who would know are their parents because that's the last people they would want to see them doing the wrongdoings. They said freak offs. You're not implying that you knew about those things, are you? I know that. You're not doing that. No mother would. Any man that I know throughout life that it is engaged in any level of promiscuity whatsoever. Mama might know in general that's his tendency, but she ain't an eyewitness to it because the last person you want to see that kind of behavior is your mama. Y'all feel me? Am I making sense? Do I need to get a poll out there and put a poll up to ask who is Stephen A making sense? I am not rooting for anyone innocent to go through what P. Diddy is going through. And if he is innocent, I pray that he is. I wish him nothing but freedom and the best and to go on with his life if he's innocent. But if he's guilty, there are a plethora of victims. I told you the girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, Cassie Ventura, there are male sex workers that have been mentioned in all of this. There are others, women, that claim to be assaulted and raped and forced to and compelled to do some of the things that he wanted them to do.
All I'm saying is the last person who would know about such details of such heinous transgressions, albeit allegedly, the last person who would know that on the part of a man is his mama. I would ask y'all, am I making sense? But you know I am. Those statements from somebody in the music industry who worked with them, who was in his inner circle or something like that would be different. Nobody is going to attach objective credibility or believe objective credibility is coming from the accused mama. It just ain't going to happen. It just ain't going to happen. Coming up, the New York Liberty are standing at the doorstep of a championship. But first, I've got to give props, believe it or not, to the New York Mets and affiliates and what they're doing this postseason. It's not what you think. It's not literally about the games. It's about something else. You need to hear it from me. You'll understand where I'm coming from. Stick around. Last segment of the Stephen A. Smith Show coming up in a minute. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. Let's get to a couple of more sports stories before we get to your tweets and I get on out of here for the day. First up, I'll start with baseball and the National League Division Series between the Mets and the Phillies where the division rivals are putting on the show for the fans. The series is tied 1-1 after Philly walked off last night following the Mets tying the game in the ninth inning. Let me explain something to y'all why I wanted to bring up this subject. Yes, the Mets have been exciting. Yes, every single game there's been somebody trailing in the eighth inning and then something miraculous happens to end the game, whether it would be the Mets versus Milwaukee in the first series or is the Mets going up against the Phillies right now in the divisional playoff series. Don't forget about Shohei Otani and the Dodgers going up against, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the San Diego Padres. Don't forget about the Yankees and Weaver looking like he Mariano Rivera for one night against the Royals. Don't forget any of that stuff. But here's what I would say to you that I love. When we look at baseball, whether it's shifting rules, whether it's the pitch count, whether it's the clock, et cetera, it's invited more athleticism into the game of baseball. And the game of baseball has become, become incredibly exciting. I'm looking at the Mets and the Phillies talk smack to one another, okay? I'm, I'm looking at stuff like that, and then I'm seeing instead of Oh, the pitcher's going to hit the next batter because he didn't like the way somebody said something to him or something along those lines. We're seeing cats go up there and go at one another in the sport of baseball. This is the kind of stuff that builds fandom. This is the kind of stuff that you, that you get, that gets you excited about the competition. And that's what I love for what I'm seeing from the New York Mets. They'll never say die. They could be down in the seventh and an eighth and a ninth and then they come back. They've got more comebacks than anybody in Major League Baseball this season. This is what they do. They don't relent. They don't don't give up. They fight until the last drop. And the Phillies ain't far behind with Castellanos, with Bryce Harper, and the rest of the career. Real Muto and those boys. They are no joke either. It's the first time the Phillies and the Mets are going up against one another in the postseason. Obviously, because of the advent of the wild card spots, the first one and then the second one over the last couple of years or so, you can do that now, whereas before playing in the same division ensured that you wouldn't be able to meet one another. But times have changed. Baseball, for once, isn't the last to the party, you know, conspicuously. They literally are making a run to generate fandom and to build a fan base. The games have sped up. There's more stolen bases. There's more run production, okay? And you're not as reliant on the home run in order to manufacture runs. I only have one wish for baseball, and this is for the manager, this is for the players, this is for everybody. Damn it, beat each other. No intentional walks. Don't have people get stuck in traffic trying to pack 50, 60,000 into a baseball stadium looking forward to seeing some of their base, favorite baseball players. And then all of a sudden you come up to bat, whether you are an Aaron Judge or a Shohei Otani or a Mookie Betts or anybody in between. And guess what? You get to intentionally walk them. Eradicate that. Test their manhood. Say, you a professional, you a professional. You go up against each other. Mono and mono, let's get it on. Baseball gets rid of the intentional walk. They eradicate that, and they go about the business of going at 
one another and competing against one another. That would be the finishing touch to resurrecting this sport for the next generation, meaning this one right now. Could you imagine back in the day if you had walked up to Randy Johnson and you had said to him or Roger Clemens or someone along those lines or, or Maddox and one of Glavin and one of those boys, and you said, you know what? We don't want you pitching to McGuire. We don't want you pitching to Barry Bonds. We want you to intentionally walk them. They'd have looked at you like you was an alien, like you were an alien. They'd have told you to get the hell out their damn face. That is what baseball needs. That kind of attitude, let's get it on. No intentional walks. That's the one thing they need to fix and watch the game soar even more. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I know. Now let's get to the WNBA, where the New York Liberty are once again headed to the finals. New York eliminated the two-time defending champion Las Vegas Aces yesterday, 76-62. The Liberty were led by Sabrina Ionescu, who dropped 22 on the Aces. Now this is the sixth time the Liberty have made the finals where history doesn't seem to favor them. They have never won a title. You better damn well win now. You take out Asia Wilson and Kelsey Plum and Gray and the rest of the crew, but you can't beat the Connecticut Sun or the Minnesota Lynx or somebody. You got your damn mind. You better handle your business. You better handle your business. This is the time for the New York Liberty. You know what I'm saying? Brianna Stewart balling the way that she does. UNESCO, you know how much you love Kobe. You know how proud he was of you. He's watching. Go out there and do your thing like I know you will. Liberty, stand up. New York, stand up. You're about to bring a championship to New York. I believe in the Liberty. You got to get it done, though. Can't beat the Vegas Aces and lose to somebody else. Can't beat Asia Wilson and lose to somebody else. No. Don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. Okay? Handle your business. This is your time. This is your time. New York handled this business. Now we've got Minnesota, all right, going up against, you know, Connecticut. And the winner takes on the Liberty for the championship. New York, stand up. I'm going to leave it at that. Before I get to my tweets, I got to take a moment to give a shout out to one of my newest colleagues, NBA reporter Sham Sharania will be joining ESPN as our senior NBA insider. Effective immediately. You'll see him on television Thursday morning. Don't miss it. He's filling the shoes of the great Adrian Wojnarowski, who I had the pleasure of working with over the last several years, uh, who decided to retire from the business in order to take over sports at St. Bonaventure University, his alma mater. First things first, there's only one Woj. And on this particular day, I'm going to give props and love and deference to him uh, because he did a phenomenal job for ESPN over the years and deserves so much credit for the work that he has done. Uh, he will always be a friend of this show. Uh, he will always be a credit to the industry. And all of us who have covered the NBA uh, will never fail to show our appreciation for the marvelous work that Woj did throughout the years in leading all of the insiders in terms of his connections, the breaking stories, um, and the storylines that he helped contribute to a myriad of shows gracing the airwaves of ESPN and ABC throughout the years. Major props to him, and I'm always have love for my man Woj. I don't know Sham Sharania. Here's what I will tell you about him. He's one of the best in the business. And if there was an ideal replacement for Adrian Wojnarowski, it is him. The man has his contacts, he has his sources, he knows what he's talking about, he's very well connected, he's young, but he puts in the work, he gets on his grind, and he does what's necessary to be that guy. There was no greater competitor to Woj in the business in the modern era than Sham Sharania. And the fact that he is now coming to ESPN is something that I welcome, that I think we all should welcome. And I'm looking forward to welcoming him as the newest member of the ESPN family. Congrats to him. Long overdue. Well deserved. Nobody comes before Woj in my mind. But this brother right here is a welcomed addition to the ESPN family. I think you've seen him on several occasions on the Pat McAfee show throughout the years. Now you'll see him gracing the airwaves of the Pat McAfee show and other shows on ESPN. And we will more than welcome him to the platform. We wish him nothing but the best, and we're all teammates, so I'm looking forward to having him on board. Now I got some tweets to get to before we get on out of here for the day. 
because y'all like to tweet me from time to time. So let's get it on. Let's see what these tweets are saying. First up, at Sunday Dreads, right? Stephen A., who would you call if you had to fight Undertaker 1 versus 2 at Survivor Series? 1 versus 2? Is that what it is? Who would I call? <laughs> well, let me ask you this question. Is that right now? Is that right now? Because I would tell you, first on my list would be The Rock. Can you smell what The Rock is cooking? Yes, it would be him. And if it was younger, like let's say a decade ago, I would call Goldberg. Those would be my two choices. Those would be my two choices, okay? Next up, what you got? At Sports Guy Sean Zero, right, Stephen A. Smith? If the Jets go to two and four, would it even be worth it to go after Devontae Adams? I say yes. It's a 17 game season. I would go after Devontae Adams. I got Aaron Rodgers. I got Garrett Wilson. I don't know what the hell is going on with Brees Hall and why Robert Sala ain't running, him the, running the football with him more. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand it, but I think that's a coaching issue. But even that, I'm still going to hold Aaron Rodgers accountable because we know the offense belongs to him and Nathaniel Hackett. But I would tell you, Devontae Adams being back with Aaron Rodgers and Garrett Wilson being in that lineup, I think it would make the Jets significantly more formidable. I think their defense is elite enough. If you gave them anything offensively, they can make some noise for you. You still have would have 11 games to go if you're 2 and 4, and I'll say that would be absolutely fine. That would be more than enough time to win the AFC East and to make some noise in the playoffs. You damn right you go and get Devontae Adams if you can. Next up, at Luca underscore 2124. Let's see this here. Stephen A. Smith. Who would you rather have as a duo partner, Shaq or LeBron in Fortnite? Hmm, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. I want to say LeBron, but I like my life and I want to live and I don't want Shaq to kill me. But I can't be scared of Shaq killing me and compromise my integrity and telling the truth. When I think about Fortnite, LeBron, see, when I think about Shaq, I think about power and dominance. When I think about LeBron, I think about versatility. And I like versatility, but I also like power. Hmm. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I'm going to go with Shaq because I'm going to go with power and dominance. And I'll handle the other stuff if I were his teammate. What do I need but so much versatility for when I got this level of dominance? You see what I'm saying? That's how I'm going to go with it. Come here for a second. Let me ask my little nephew. Come on over here. My little nephew right here. Hurry up, man. Birthday boy. Come here, man. Come here. Look into the camera. Man. Look into the camera, man. This is my little 12-year-old great nephew right here. Just turned 12 years old yesterday. His name is Jay. Say what's up, man. Say what's up, man. Say what's up. Okay. Now, who should I pick here? Tell me this, man. No, 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 no. You guys be coming in, come closer to me because they can't hear you. So speak into my microphone right here. Go ahead. Go ahead. According to my Fortnite calculations, LeBron would be a better pick because Shaq has a bigger hitbox because his waist is bigger and LeBron is slimmer. And so because LeBron is slimmer and has a smaller hitbox, hit it's harder to hit him? Yeah. I'm going to go with my little nephew. Yeah. That's what he told me to do, so that's what I'm going to do. Way to go, boy. Way to go. Get out of here. Get out of here. My little nephew, he said LeBron, smaller hip. I got it. We going to roll with him. Let's go with the last one right here, please. Let's go with the last one. Book it with Trent. There we go. This boy from Prize Picks. I remember him. I had him on the show. He was a good guest, too. Stephen A. Smith, remember you told me this was an absolute donation? Josh Allen. Less, 12 and a half pass interceptions. Yes. I said he would have more, right? Don't they have about 12 games left? Don't you think you need to wait a few weeks, book it with Trent before you come at me? You know you're usually wrong, right? Pump the brakes, bruh. Pump the brakes. I understand you know, we got a little connection here. Prospects is very, very important to us. Ain't nothing but love for you. But pump the brakes, bruh. We got 
12 games to go. There's time for Josh Allen to throw more than 12 and a half interceptions. There is time. McDermott is still coaching him. Remember that. Almost threw him to the wolves the other night. I'm just saying. That's it for this edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. I got to get on out of here. I hope you all enjoyed the show. I'll be back with you in a few days. Until then, peace and love, everybody. It's your boy, signing off.